typically uh, it's going to be like uh, you know a number of problems exactly the same kind of problems that we solve during the lecture or that you have in your problem sets okay so some people have emailed me asking me what is the best way to uh, to prepare for the midterm not just for the midterm in this course in general the best way to prepare is for you to be able to have the confidence that you can solve a problem alone so it's not enough for you to just watch me solve problems it's not enough for you to look at the ta or to look at solutions that somebody else produced what you need to do is solve those problems uh, on your own before seeing the solutions and then you compare the solutions with uh you know whatever is there so uh i would say as as an advice go through the different chapters and solve the the examples or the exercises that are within the chapters the ones that i do here uh during the class but solve them with, without looking okay just try to solve them and whenever you get stuck uh, you, you, you don't just don't try right away to go into seeing how it's being solved just try to work your your way through uh it's good practice to try to develop your own methodology of coming to understand how to use the different uh theorems and uh methods of solution and it's a good thing to have those problems solved in the textbook. So you try to do them by yourself. Once you did it, you finished it, you look and you see, you compare with whatever the solution is there. And then you move on to solving all the other ones, the ones that we do in the problem sets. Today we're starting a new topic, chapter six, entitled Capacitors and Inductors. So introduction, resistors, we've seen resistors. Resistors are passive elements that dissipate energy. Now, we talked about that. Whenever there is a current flowing through a resistor, there is power that gets dissipated or consumed. And we said that power is always consumed by resistor, meaning that the resistor will always take that power or that energy from the rest of the circuit, from the other elements. In fact, we uh, looked at what we called the balance of power, where we said that if you have any sources in the circuit that are giving power or energy to the circuit, then it has to be balanced out by the same amount of energy or power that is taken away from the circuit through the resistors. So the resistors are going are always going to take that power away. And the way they take it away is uh, usually in the form of heat. So the electrical energy is going to dissipate in the form of heat. And sometimes there'll be something else if this resistance represents another device. So for example, if the resistance represents a lamp, then we say that part of that uh, power or that energy is going to become light. Okay. Now, capacitors are inductor and inductors are also passive elements, but they function in a different way. They actually store energy. They do not dissipate the energy. So that's why they are called energy storage elements. Okay. So uh, you have these words here, energy storage elements. Okay, and they do not dissipate or consume energy. They store it, and we're going to see how they store it. Okay, so we have capacitors and inductors. They like they both operate based on a totally different uh, physical principles, but they both are going to end up storing the energy within the capacitor or the inductor itself. So think about it this way: it's like a device that's there. If it stores energy, means it takes the energy from the rest of the circuit, from the other elements, from you know, from other sources. It takes the energy and stores it within itself. And then at some point, it's going to release that energy. It's going to give it away back to the circuit. So it doesn't dissipate. It's, it's not like a resistor that completely takes it out of, of, of the circuit. What capacitors and inductors do, at some point during whatever cycles, you're going to see when that happens, they're going to act as if they are taking the energy from the rest of the circuit. And then in other circumstances, they're going to be giving back this amount of energy stored into the circuit. So at some point, they act almost like a resistor. It's not a resistor, but it's kind of looks like, you know, a device that takes the energy away. But, it, but then at other points in time, if they have energy stored in, within themselves, those capacitors and inductors, 
they may give back this energy. So they're gonna act actually effectively like a source, okay? So we call them energy storage elements. A capacitor is a passive circuit that stores energy in the form of an electric field. So this is what a capacitor does. Now, a capacitor is built physically with um, two parallel plates of conducting material, usually a metal, but it could be anything that, that is conducting. And if you have these two parallel plates, you see them in, uh, in this uh, pale yellowish color. What happens is you have those two plates and they are separated by an insulator. Or sometimes we call the insulator, we call it a dielectric. Okay? So there is no way the current can actually flow from inside, but somehow we find this interesting phenomenon that takes place. What happens, look, we have a voltage source down there, plus or minus. So the positive side of the voltage source is going to create a positive charge on the plate attached to it. And the negative side of your voltage source is going to create a negative charge on the plate that is attached to it. Okay. Now, how does that happen? Now, the voltage source, what it does, the, 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 the positive side of the voltage source, that's a positive charge of your voltage source, is going to attract electrons, right? Because it's positive, and electrons are negative. So it's like all the electrons that are on that metal plate, we call them free electrons because they're free to move, they get attracted from that plate and they go into your source. And what remains there is uh, like, you know, it's, it's like a deficit of negative charges, if you will. The electrons have disappeared. So it's like it turns uh, positive. It's like you have a surplus of positive charges on that particular plate, the left-hand plate. Okay? And what happens to the plate that is connected to the negative side of your voltage source? Now, the negative... Uh, means it is going to, uh, it's negative, it repels electrons, so it pushes electrons away, so it's going to push them from the source onto the plate. So you're going to have a surplus of electrons that are going to accumulate on this left, uh, sorry, on the right side uh, plane over there. Okay, so you're going to have lots of electrons there coming from that negative side of your source. And they're going to accumulate there. Now, when you have Two plates like that, where on one side you have a surplus of positive charge, and on the other side you have a surplus of negative charges, you get an electric field in between those two plates. Now, the electric field extends through the dielectric or the insulator. Okay? This is how uh, the energy gets stored inside. So the energy is stored inside the electric field. And if you have a stronger electric field, it means you have more energy stored in that electric field. Now, we have a symbol for a capacitor. It's those two parallel lines. Um, we have a voltage applied across the capacitor, and we say we have a current flowing through the capacitor. Now, in fact, we don't really have a current flowing through, but what happens is, imagine you have a capacitor that is discharged, like no charges on it, and then you connect it to a voltage source. This phenomenon that I just described, where you have the electrons flowing, leaving this left-hand side plane, going to, the, the electrons are, are leaving, they're going to the source. On the other side, you have electrons being pushed onto the other side. So there's a movement of electrons just during a short period of time until the capacitor gets fully charged. So during that time, it appears to us as if there is a current flow, because those electrons are going through those wires. Yes. No, the electrons, the electrons do not flow through the electric field. The electrons uh, get accumulated only onto the plates, or they get depleted from the plates, but they cannot jump through the electric field because the electric field is actually uh, present uh, through an insulating material. Electrons cannot flow through that. Okay? But if you look at any of those wires that are connecting the capacitor to the source, you find that like during just a little bit of time in the beginning when those electrons are being attracted on one side and pushed around to the other side, it appears to us as if there is a current that is flowing only during 
very short amount of time. Okay? But once the capacitor is fully charged, I mean, it reaches that steady state, it reaches that, uh, you know, like that situation where the electrons have stabilized, then there's more, no more current that flows. And we're going to see how that translates into equations. The symbol, so this is the symbol for the, uh, the capacitor, and we say it has a capacitance C. Okay, that's the value that we give to a capacitor. Now, capacitance is the ratio of the charge on one plate of a capacitor to the voltage difference between the two plates measured in farads. Okay, so the voltage difference between the two plates, that comes from this voltage source. And you look at how much charge you have on one of those plates. Obviously, the charges uh, on one plate are exactly the same as the charges on the other plate. Okay, every time an electron leaves one plate, another goes and parks on the other side, on the other plate. So they're always equal. But one side has a positive charge plus Q. The other side has a negative charge minus Q. Now, there is a ratio between these. And we have this equation Q, this amount of charge, is equal to CV. Because Q is going to be proportional to the voltage. If you have a larger voltage applied across these two plates, you have more charge. If you increase the voltage, you, you kind of increase the amount of charge that is going to end up accumulating on those plates. So Q, the charge on any of those plates, is proportional to the voltage, and this constant of proportionality is this value C of the capacitor, Q equals CV. Okay? And we say that if the voltage is in, if, uh, if it is in volts, the charge Q is in coulombs, then the capacitance C is measured in farads with the symbol F, capital F, and one farad is one coulomb per volt. Okay. Any questions? That's a very simple example. Calculate the charge stored on a three picofarad capacitor with 20 volts across it. I have a capacitor like that. The capacitance C equals 3 picofarad. What's a pico? Times to the negative 12. 10 to the 12, exactly. So that's 3 times 10 to the negative 12 farads. And we want to know the charge that equals CV, when the voltage V tells us that the voltage V applied here is 20 volts. OK, so Q equals. 3 times 10 to the 12 times 12, right? OK. Now, the capacitance, which is this uh, proportionality constant between the charge and the voltage. I'm going to look at it again here. Basically, a typical capacitor is going to have those two parallel plates with the dielectric in between, and they have parameters associated with them. So the dielectric in between those parameters, this insulator, has what we call a permittivity epsilon. Okay, And then those two plates, they have an area. Of course, the area is going to be important because a larger area means you can store more charges on that. Okay, so it gives it bigger capacitance. Okay, that's the area A. And then you have the distance between the two plates, which is the thickness of this insulator, the distance in between. Okay, now if you have a very large distance in between them, that weakens your capacitance. Okay, you want to have the, the, the distance very, very small. That's why the capacitance is inversely proportional to B. And you get this equation where the capacitance C is equal to epsilon times A over D. That's when you, you have those parameters and you want to compute how much capacitance you get from those particular dimensions with those parameters. OK. Current voltage relationship for a capacitor. Now, I said that um, it appears to us on those wires like there's a current flowing 
but just for a small time, right? Until everything stabilizes, which means that the current appears to flow through those wires whenever there is change in the, the charge. Okay? If the charges are constant and there's no change, there's no redistribution of charges, then I'm not gonna measure any current through those wires. But if my charges are in, 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 in a state of change, like more charges are accumulating, so the, the charges are actually moving, okay? So if there is a change in the charge itself, I'm gonna get current. And the charge itself tells me, I mean, it's related to the voltage because if you have more voltage across it, you have more charge. So if the voltage across your capacitor keeps changing, it means the charge is gonna keep redistributing. It means I'm gonna see a movement of those charges through the wires. And it appears to me like there's current flowing. Well, the current actually does flow through the wires, but it appears as if it's going through the capacitor. We just understand it doesn't jump inside the dielectric. The electrons don't move in there, but this redistribution of the charges on those two plates uh, gives rise to what we measure from the outside as a current. So we know that Q equals CV, and by definition, I equals dQ dt. That's from the very first chapter. Therefore, I is equal to d, Q is CV, so you, you, you differentiate that dt, and you get I equals C dV dt. Okay? So there is a current if you can find a derivative dV dt. And we're going to see how that actually manifests in, uh, in, in uh, real examples. But this is the voltage current or the current voltage relationship. I is equal to C dV dt. I have to remember how this is different from any of the other elements that we've seen before. And if you have a resistance, the resistance is defined by Ohm's law, right? V equals IR. So the relationship between the voltage and the current is defined by the standard relationship. For a capacitor, what is the relationship between the voltage and the current? The current I is equal to C times dV dt. That's the relationship that connects both of these together. Example, we have the voltage across a 5 microfarad capacitor. Micro, that's 10 to the minus 6. And we have the voltage that's equal to 10 cosine 6,000 T in volts. Now look at that. The voltage here is not a constant voltage, right? It's a voltage that's constantly changing because it's a sinusoidal function. So at any instant in time, the voltage has a value. And then if you look at it just like, you know, after a very small amount of time, this value is going to be changing and it's going to look like a sinusoid going up and then going to zero and then becoming negative and then going back to zero continuously. So it's a sinusoidal function, which means that it's never going to give you a stable uh, distribution of electrons across those uh, capacitor plates. Those electrons are constantly going to be going back and forth and redistributing. So that's why we're always going to have a current here. And you can find that just by looking at our equation. This current I equals C dV dt. So that is C. Oh, what is dV dt? So it's D by dt, 10 cosine 6,000 T, right? We have 5 times 10 to the negative 16. No, sorry, uh, negative 6. That's microfarads. Multiplied by, I want to find the, the, der the derivative of this with respect to time. So I have 10. That's a constant. And then what's d by dt of cosine? Negative sign. Thank you very much. Negative sine 6,000 T, and then the 6,000 here, though, is also going to show up here, right? So what do we have? Hmm. 
Okay, that's in amps. And what do I have here? One, two, three, four, five. So that's minus 0.3 sine 6,000 T. So I equals C D D D T. You do the math, you get the equation for I. Now look at that. The voltage, this is the, 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 the amplitude of your voltage. It's 10 volts. That's the maximum value it's going to reach. The current is going to reach a maximum amplitude of 0.3 amps. The voltage is described by the cosine function, and the current is described by the sine function with the, with the, with the negative x bar. Okay? So if you want to plot both of them, sine and cosine, they're not going to be in phase. Right? They're not, the voltage and the current are not going to go up and down together. We have here another example. Determine the current through a 200 microfarad capacitor whose voltage is shown below. So I have a voltage here. Okay, here's the this is this axis is time. Here is V of T. Zero. One, two, three, and four. The peak is at 50 volts here. And here, that's, we want to find current. If you have this V of T across the capacitor, how much would you measure the current to be uh, like that? So the current I equals C D D D T, right? And C is 200 micro power. So now I need to find D V D T. When you have a curve like that, D V D T is the slope, right? So we're going to work in segments. Okay, that's the slope. So the current I here is C times dV dt. So in this first segment here, I equals 200 times 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by 50, right? So that's 10,000 times 10 to the negative 6. That's 10 milliamps. 
Okay. So now this is a straight line. DVDT for a straight line is a constant. So the current is proportional to DVDT. So the current is going to be constant. You're going to have something like that at 10 milliamps. Sorry? Zoom out? Oh, zoom out. So, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Now, for the second segment, this part here, Actually, it's all of that, right? DVDT equals. So you look at the vertical distance, that's 100, but it's a negative 100. Over the horizontal distance, that's 2. So it's negative 50 volt per second, right? Well, actually, it's kind of the it looks like the same slope as this one except that it's negative okay so if we look at the second part from t equals one to t equals three seconds dv dt equals negative 50 volt per second, which gives me a current I of negative 10 milliamps. Okay. So I'm going to look here. I'm going to have a current equal to negative 10 milliamps, like that. What about the very last segment from three to four seconds? This slope is the same as this slope. If you compute it, this one, dvdt equals 50 volt per second as well, this one. And so at this point here, if you calculate the current I, 200 microfarad times 50 gives you 10 milliamps, so it goes back up to that point. Right now. Okay, any questions? So, important notes. We said I equals C dV dt. Just by looking at this relationship between the current and the voltage, we can deduce some very interesting uh, characteristics that relate to the capacitor. So first thing, if you have a constant voltage, if I'm putting a DC voltage across my capacitor, say V equals 5 volts, V equals 10 volts, V equals 100 volts, whatever it is, but it's a constant. What would be dV dt? So it says that the current is going to be equal to zero if the voltage is a constant. So if you have a voltage and no current, it tells me that the capacitor, for all practical purposes, is like an open circuit in the presence of a constant voltage. And that's what I explained in the beginning. If there is no change in
and I have a voltage that looks like this with time. Okay. Now this is a voltage that changed instantaneously here, right? It jumped. Right until this point in time, it had a certain value, and then instantaneously it took on another voltage value. So there's been a jump here, instantaneous change. Now for that to happen, it means that it had a particular value here, like a certain number of charges, and then in zero time, the charges are expected to be something else. Now charges need to flow to rearrange. So it's not possible for the voltage to just jump instantaneously from here to here because the charges will not have the time to um, rearrange themselves. They cannot do that in zero time. If you look at the equation, I equals C dV dt, if what would be dV dt exactly here, like this vertical jump? If you have a vertical line, what is the slope of a vertical line? infinite, right? So you would need an infinite current to allow for the voltage to jump. We don't have infinite currents in real life, right? It's not possible. So that's going to hinder uh, this from happening. You will never ever be able to have a voltage across your capacitor that jumps instantaneously in zero time from one value to another value. That's not possible. Voltage has to transition through a continuous waveform. Now, let's go back to the problem that we had here. Look at that. See the voltage here? It went up from 0 to 50, and then it went down from 50 to minus 50, and it went up again to 0, but it never got uh, any discontinuities. You see that? So that's why that's OK. That's possible. Now look at the current in the capacitor. The current did jump, right? It was 10 milliamps constant until here. And then all of a
minus infinity to t i of tau d tau. Okay. So I have here 1 over 2 times 10 to the negative 6. I of tau d tau, I have, well, the 6 can come outside, so I can put it here. E to minus 3000 tau d tau. Six, and then this integral e to the minus three thousand tau becomes e to the minus three thousand tau divided by minus three thousand, right? And the limits would be minus infinity to t. So I have a minus sign, and I have times 10 to the 6th That's the whole time. From minus infinity to zero. Plus from zero. And the reason I'm saying that is because I'm going to put that here. The reason I'm saying that I divided that, they're not asking it in terms of time. They're saying you have this current, find the voltage. Now, this current is going to kind of redistribute the charges. We want to see what is the voltage going to end up being. So the initial value is zero, means like when we started applying this current or I of uh, like a t equals zero. So all of that from negative infinity to zero, this one that should use my initial condition. Which is equal to zero. So Basically, I have an integral from zero to infinity. So let's do that. The very last sentence. Minus 
minus e to the minus zero. What is e to the minus infinity? What's e to the minus infinity? No. e to the minus infinity is 1 over e to the power infinity. e to the power infinity is infinity. Okay? So 1 over that is 0. So e to the negative infinity, this one is 0. What is e to the 0? That's 1. Okay? So, you're going to have minus 1,000, 0 minus 1. Okay? Um, be careful here, I had a milliamps. So that should be eventually, that, that's 1,000 millivolts, right? It's equal to 1 volt. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to find the voltage. If we have this current, they're not giving us the limit, so that's why it, it looked like it's a bit confusing. But in general, you will be able to determine what the limits are and it makes it a bit easier. Now, what is the power in a capacitor? Now, that's an interesting question. We know that P in general, the power, instantaneous power, P equals V times I. And here in the capacitor, we have that I is equal to C dV dt, which means that the power P equals CV dV dt, right? So we get an equation, and the power here is in terms of the voltage. So it's kind of funny because you have C multiplied by voltage multiplied by d by dt of that voltage. So just a quick question here. If the voltage is constant, how much is the power? Zero. Okay. Okay. Now, if I if I, if I have a, a a changing voltage, like we saw, like a sinusoidal or you know, like a, a, a triangular waveform, something that keeps changing, you're going to have dV dt. Okay. And if dV dt multiplied by v multiplied by c is a positive value, 